The press has been a changing cultural stamp of America for over a century. First, we had word of mouth. Then, we had the newspaper. Then, the radio. Then, the television. From the floor earlier. And now, the internet. But how is the freedom of press affected from these changes in media? This makes us question how the press is presenting itself today. Well, freedom of the press is important to the people in the United States because the people expect us to tell them what's going on in the government and in their world. I mean, you had newspapers that didn't have Facebook pages even six, seven years ago. I think really underestimated the effect that social media was going to have on news and journalism. People today have become reliant on getting news from social media, myself included. Since my generation basically lives off social media, it's a good way to keep us informed on what's going on around the world. And while all this is a good thing, there is a downside to it. Twitter has a feature called Moments, where it features the latest news and tweets from its users. The problem with this is that any user can create their own moment therefore spreading incorrect news. For example, there was a Twitter moment stating that the FCC chairman, Ajit Pai, was found dead in his home, but it wasn't true. It was made by a random Twitter user. Now, this wouldn't really matter if people didn't rely on social media for their news, but they do. Nearly 67% of Americans have at some point in their lives, including us. This is a problem, because what if the news my generation and I are reading is not true? What if it's like the Twitter moment with Ajit Pai? What if... It's fake news. People in social media, as a general rule, are not trying journalists. They're not answering those four prudent questions before they're giving the news, and that is, does the public need to know? Does the public want to know? Does the public have a right to know? And is this doing no harm to anyone? We see things all the time that certainly aren't fact-checked, that are just, you know, a product of someone's imagination. And all of a sudden, nobody knows what to believe about anything. And an uninformed people are a people that are in jeopardy. Within hours of the mass shooting in Sutherland Springs, Texas on Sunday, if you were to search YouTube for information about that massacre, you might have come across a video by a right-wing shock jock named Elmer T. Williams. And there you would find a rambling video monologue that was full of false claims, but posted soon enough to take advantage of breaking news interest, and even become temporarily prioritized by YouTube's own algorithm. Elmer T. Williams is a prime example of this. He deems himself as the doctor of common sense and has made claims that range from inference-based speculations to flat-out lies. He has uploaded over 10,000 videos to YouTube about mass shootings, political party conspiracies, and even Hillary Clinton being on cocaine before his YouTube was terminated in November of 2017 for violations of YouTube's policy prohibiting hate speech. But if what he's putting out is news, or at least what he claims to be news, then isn't he protected by freedom of the press? In which case, were YouTube's actions constitutional? Even though we don't agree with what Williams was claiming, did YouTube have the right to shut down his media operation? And as soon as conservatives start spending their money with YouTube, YouTube will collapse too. You think YouTube is more powerful than God Almighty? I don't think so. We can't keep allowing liberals to run things. That's why I don't spend my money at, over at uh, Starbucks. You now, if you're a blogger at your mom's house in your room, you have the same publishing power the, as the New York Times. For example, people have created entire careers on reporting the news, or what they consider to be the news, which vary from actual stories to conspiracies that they believe to be true, and they report it as if it is. This wouldn't be a problem if they weren't catching the public's attention, but they are. These channels have hundreds of thousands of subscribers and get thousands of views on each video. I think it's very, very true that with any great technology that has come out for good, someone's used it for evil. So what if people are spreading news that isn't true? Is it really a big deal? The answer is yes, especially when it affects an election. On November 1st, 2017, members of Twitter, Google, and Facebook testified before Congress because of fake news advertisements created by Russia in hopes to influence our 2016 presidential election in Donald Trump's favor. But if I understand your testimony here today, it's that 80,000 posts by the Russian-linked Internet Research Agency were seen by 29 million Americans and may have reached an estimated 126 million people. Why has it taken Facebook 11 months to come forward and help us understand the scope of this problem, see it clearly for the problem it is, and begin to work in a responsible legislative way to address it? To put these facts in perspective, 
126 million people is equivalent to about half of the Americans registered to vote. Over half of our voters could have been potentially persuaded by these ads, backing up one political party over another. Considering the reliability of the information put out on new media, should the protections of the First Amendment apply as much to new media as they do to traditional media. Now it's true that Facebook is not a news organization. I do believe it is now a central part of the news ecosystem. With that comes real responsibility to work very closely with the industry and be a true partner with the news industry. We should all care about helping people make smart decisions about the information that they see online and what sources to trust. And in order that we can trust those sources, we believe that they should responsibly regulate themselves rather than be restricted or censored by the government. That way, news consumers aren't as pressed.